Seeing this play was a huge reminder to me of two things. The first was how surprising and exciting and thrilling theatre can be, and the second was I desperately need a pair of cowboy boots. Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. And this is my theatre-themed YouTube channel, where I review the shows that I have been invited to go and see as an independent professional theatre critic, as well as a content creator. Now, last week, I was invited to go to stratford upon a to the Royal Shakespeare Company to see the brand new play Cowboys, written by Charlie Josephine. Now, I'd been to the RSC for the first time only a few months previously, and they were already advertising Cowboys. And I was particularly intrigued by this production because I saw another of Charlie Josephine's plays last year at the Globe Theatre. That one was called I, Joan. Now, I didn't review that on here because I was reviewing for whatsonstage.com, but I did give it a five-star review. It was an exciting, riotous piece of queer theatre, the likes of which I had never seen before. And it was a collaboration between exciting performers and exciting designers, but the most exciting to me was this incredible new voice, this playwright, Charlie Josephine. And so, deeply fascinated about what Cowboys was going to be like. Also, as will become hugely apparent in this review, this is a queer piece of theatre and I so support and endorse and celebrate the Royal Shakespeare Company, this historic theatrical space, uplifting not only new writing but new queer theatre. I think that's so important and it needs to be celebrated and acknowledged. So today I'm going to be letting you know what I thought of Cowboys. Did it live up to my admittedly high expectations? And given that I was expecting a certain amount of riotousness going in, how did it still manage to surprise me? Shock me even? You will find out in today's video. Now if you enjoy this one, make sure to subscribe to my theatre themed YouTube channel. I will be sharing many more reviews about all of the shows that I see here in London. I have some more Broadway reviews coming up from my recent trip to New York. Who knows where I'm going next year? I, I haven't got that far ahead. But there will be much more stagey content coming soon, so make sure you're subscribed. For now, let's talk all about cowboys. Yee-haw! I can't pull that off. I knew instantly that was a mistake. So explaining the nature of this play to you is a little bit of a tall order because it was really expansive as it went on and exactly what it was and the tone of the thing shifted three times. I would say even though this was a two act play it was split into four discernible sections. And before I tell you about what happened in each of those I want to explain a little bit about the previous play I saw by the same playwright I Joan because that put me in a pretty good position uh, to know what I should expect with this. So I Joan was a theatricalization of the story of Joan of Arc but reconceiving Joan as a trans non-binary figure. And and using their story in order to explore ideas around gender and ideas around identity in this historical context and trying to fuse together the historical story and this very contemporary conversation. Needless to say, the current climate around this conversation and the rights of trans people is an increasingly hostile and oppressive one. And needless to say, because simply existing as a trans person in society right now is an inherently brave and rebellious act, appearing on a stage takes that one step further and writing a story that is gender non-conforming and that, uh, you know, deals with trans themes very brave. At this point, I will also say, though, I usually welcome all opinions in my reviews. If you are not an active ally to the trans community, then I'm not really interested in hearing what you have to say about it. Let's get back to Cowboys. So it's set in the Old West, right? And we begin in this sleepy town where all of the women of the town are commiserating about the fact that their husbands and the men of the town, all except for the drunken sheriff, all went off, they travelled away together about a year ago in search of gold, in search of prosperity, and they haven't returned and they are missing, presumed dead, because they haven't heard from them in a very long time. And the women are trying to not only keep the town going in their absence, uh, but they're trying to keep themselves safe should any unsavoury characters appear. And sure enough, we fairly soon get the arrival of one such unsavoury character, a bandit named Jack. Jack, who is portrayed by the actor Vinnie Heaven, who uses they them pronouns is perceived first as a threat and as a danger and then later as an individual at which point a conversation around 
their gender identity and their gender presentation comes to the forefront, but isn't really had explicitly. Rather, we just get increasing nods in the conversation among the women of their awareness of it. And though they were initially very fearful of Jack's arrival, they become increasingly receptive and flirtatious even. And there's a palpable chemistry between Jack and Miss Lillian, who is, I guess, the landlady of the in slash bar where we find ourselves. The saloon, the Western saloon, that's the word. Pretty soon this unspoken passion between the two of them boils over into a full sensual relationship and the play then switches gears and turns from this pretty quiet and slow paced Western into something a lot more modern, something a lot more exciting. We have this complete change in lighting as the two of them then share this romantic encounter in a sort of a bathtub, a watery space that is opened up by removing one of the floor panels. This plays out for a little while and then we end the first act with this transformed impression of the town and of all of the characters in the saloon. Some of them are dressing differently and have changed their names and have sort of gained a new perspective on their own identity thanks to Jack, you know, liberating their minds. We see this very modern and uh, inclusive and really positive version of the town since Jack's arrival. The drunken sheriff has been able to combat his alcoholism and romances between different characters that they didn't even know about have been awakened. In fact, it's a veritable Wild West pride parade. That is until the very end of the first act when all of these characters' husbands return, unexpectedly. What happens then in the second act could be considered an allegory for society, where we get these old-fashioned, traditional, heteronormative, misogynistic, perspectives reconciled with the newfound, enlightened, and more modern, more progressive ideas that have come to the town in the absence of those men. The clash between which is traumatizing and tense and uncomfortable, and seems set for some sort of a very dark destination. That is until the whole thing culminates with an unexpected shootout of epic proportions. So like I said, a two-act play of four distinct parts. We have this sort of a slow, Old West story that's like a dash of Tennessee Williams, a little bit Eugene O'Neill. It then turns into this passionate and modern two-hander. The second act then turns into the last half hour of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf but with cowboy hats, and then the whole thing somehow morphs into a Tarantino by the end. It is absolutely wild and transformative, but it's also really effing cool. So that gives you a sense of what this show is about. Let me tell you what I actually thought about all of this. So for sure, it is rough around the edges. And there are moments, especially in the first half hour, where it feels needlessly slow. And it feels like there are certain moments that could be a lot faster because some of the really exciting places we get to bear so little resemblance to where we came from that you retrospectively think, I don't know why we needed to spend so much time doing that or establishing all of these characters' dynamics so repeatedly when they were pretty well introduced in the first place. I don't think the first half hour needs to be as long as it is. There are a lot of scenes when Jack arrives where we just sort of riff around the same ideas. That being said, I thought this was sensational. It's the kind of galvanizing, exciting theater that just makes me thrilled about new writing. It's inspiring in the way not a lot of writing is, and it's absolutely my favorite kind of queer theater. Charlie Josephine, who uses they, he pronouns, does something very clever here in rooting this play with its two feet in fantasy and reality in order to deliver two equally important ideas. With one hand, this play offers you a sort of a fantasia and delivers queer joy and euphoria and celebrates and uplifts and indulges in all of the impossibilities of a sort of a fantasy queer existence. And though trans people and gender nonconformity have existed historically for a very long time, this play enjoys the kind of moments that wouldn't have been historically possible, still aren't possible for people in queer relationships. With the other hand, meanwhile, it offers reality, which I think is an important balance because while it is so important for queer theater to be able to deliver joy and to celebrate and to uplift and to not be constantly traumatizing, it would be unrealistic to portray the trans experience, the queer experience, the LGBT experience as simply 
pleasant and joyous and charmed. That is not realistic. And what I love about Charlie Josephine's writing and this type of queer theatre is that we celebrate, we uplift, we deliver queer joy, but at the same time we deliver an urgent, necessary queer advocacy. It's a play both for the world that we actually live in as well as the one that we would like to create for ourselves. But Charlie Josephine, who also co-directs with Sean Holmes, he, him, they have created together so many compelling fascinating, captivating sequences. That moment in the first act where it turns into this long, extended, romantic scene between two characters just bathed in blue light and submerging themselves in water. It's sensual and it's passionate and romantic without ever being lewd. There is no nudity to speak of, but it's compellingly intimate. That we shift gears dramatically so clearly into that is also a success of the lighting design by Simeon Miller, he, him pronouns. And without knowing exactly who was responsible for what, I'm gonna go ahead and shout out the movement director, Jennifer Jackson, she, her, as well as the intimacy director, Bethan Clark. That's a very important role on a production like this. Now, Bethan was also the fight director, and I wanna talk about this end sequence as well, which is going to be a spoiler. If you don't wanna know about this, you can skip ahead to the next section. But the whole thing does kind of turn into a Tarantino-style shootout, where these characters who weren't previously agreeing with each other, these characters who have had to come to terms with changes in their relationships, they find themselves unified as they are trapped in a saloon surrounded by a mob who are desperate for revenge. With no hope of survival if they try and flee or surrender, they decide instead to find as many guns as they can and shoot their way out. And so we get this extended shootout sequence where the script is just so brilliant amidst dozens of live gunshots on stage and actual combat scenarios, you have these characters trying to work through their issues and trying to openly communicate with each other about uh, newfound sexualities and unexpected new partners and new perspectives on life. The funniest part of which is two childhood sweethearts who are trying to navigate a breakup in the middle of actual gunshots. They're like they are shooting cowboys while discussing the issues that they have with each other in their relationship. It's a hilarious sequence. It's a riotous sequence. It's something I don't think anyone has ever tried to perpetrate before on stage. And it's a smart parallel between this community simply trying to exist and simply trying to forge relationships while being literally under threat. That honestly is the concept of the whole thing. A lot of why I think this is rooted in the Wild West and this particular place and these particular characters is you have these bandits, these outlaws, who are these great placeholders for trans and non-binary characters because they're the ones in this society, in this very traditional society, who are choosing to live by their own rules and in their own way and are outlawed for that. The inherent criminality is where that comparison ends, but up to that point, it's a nice metaphor. And if I'm making the sound a little too artistically intellectual and cerebral, I promise it is hugely accessible. The language with which this is performed is so contemporary, even though it's set in the Old West. Interestingly enough, everyone is using their own natural accents. It's really just a costume that this story is wearing in order to try and articulate a point, but they're all just people. And I think the fact that they use their own accents really brings each individual's humanity to the forefront. And we care deeply about all of these characters in the first act, at least. The people who join for the second act, I care a little bit less about them, but the first act, those we care about. While I'm talking about the creative team, I absolutely have to tell you about this costume designer because I lost my entire mind at these costumes. Grace Smart, she, her, designer, incredible work, specifically the cowboy costumes and the details, because we have not only one outlaw character with Jack, who arrives in the first act, but another with Charlie Parkhurst, who arrives in the second, and the details on their cowboy outfits, I mean, they're so good. The outfits that the characters of the town wear at the end of the first act, which are these kind of cowboy outfits, but in more vibrant colors. They look like they're in a Lady Gaga music video. It's a little Barbie movie adjacent, honestly, and it's celebratory and it's queer and it's great. And as well as being this inspiring and exciting thing that deals in queer theory, it's also just so theatrically rewarding as well. It's hugely entertaining, it's really funny, 
and then deeply dramatic. Honestly, it's one of the plays I've seen recently that can so quickly and so deliberately switch gears between something traumatizingly tense and painful to something blisteringly hilarious before ending with a sequence that combines both of those things and can swap between the two in a breath. That's the true mark of writing and direction that is purposeful, knows exactly what it wants to achieve and knows exactly how to do it. But I think I've said enough about why it was that I enjoyed this show. Let me tell you about the killer performances. So we're going to get to Vinnie Heaven, who plays Jack, in just a minute. But first of all, I want to tell you about Sophie Melville, because Sophie is a performer I have seen before. She was performing in the one-person show Iphigenia in Splot recently at the Lyric Hammersmith and gave one of the most raw and exposing, vulnerable, incredible performances that I had ever seen. And she is similarly incendiary in this. While everyone around her adapts to their changing circumstances, her shifts in characterization seem to be what dictate the changing mood of the play. She begins just giving you this sort of very sweet Tennessee Williams-esque sort of a housewipe type of character before becoming lustful and passionate and willful and moving with this renewed sense of urgency and force. She grows with confidence and authority and then in the second act we see her getting squashed back into this box that she was forced to inhabit before and her movements in response to that and her characterization in response to that as she is battered emotionally and physically, she's never anything less than mesmerizing to watch. Vinnie Heaven then, who plays Jack opposite Sophie. Now the early portion of this play simply would not work if it weren't for the fact that Vinnie Heaven is such a charming personality and mysterious and enigmatic uh, because it isn't forthcoming immediately whether this is going to be a well-intentioned character or not. But we come to find out in Jack's interactions with the sheriff, in Jack's interactions with Kid, the young child of one of the women of the town, and with other members of the town, with a character named Lou who is able to gain clarity on their perspective of their own identity and their own gender, who was previously known as Lucy. And what I love about Vinny's performance is that they are able to draw on both these masculine and feminine ideas in a way that doesn't feel inherently tethered to either gender. We have this sense of confidence and swagger and a definite gruff brooding charm, but also a tremendous care and a sensitivity and a softness. It's a beautiful performance and an actor who is definitely one to watch. There is a tremendous amount of talent in the supporting cast and I could go on for a long time celebrating each individual's performance. Lucy McCormick, who uses she, her pronouns, where she starts in this show and the journey that she has. She begins repressed and a little judgmental and becomes this outspoken, brazen voice for queer advocacy. And again, is another one whose physicality of their performance is incredible. Paul Hunter, he, him, also conveys a tremendous amount of sensitivity in portraying the sheriff who also goes on a whole journey of his own. Lee Braithwaite, who uses they, he pronouns, plays the character of Lou, who is initially introduced to us as Lucy, and there is a real beauty in that characterization as well, in the honesty and the truth that emerges when they are allowed to wear the clothes that better befit the person they know themselves to be. Amidst a tremendous amount of toxicity in the second act, largely perpetrated by Sean Dingwell, who does a great job of bringing us villainy with two different characters. He plays both Frank and Tommy, both of whom create a huge amount of tension with their presence. Julian Moorcook, who is another of the town's returning men alongside him, does a terrific job at diffusing that when his character is given a lot of the more comedic moments, especially towards the end of the second act. I also need to talk about Emma Pallant, she, her, who plays a character named Sally Ann, and she is a devoted Christian who takes the longest to kind of have their eyes opened to the new way of life that Jack has brought to the town in the first act, uh, and then sort of revert on that very quickly in the second act, but you can see a constant pain behind her eyes with the way that her husband speaks to her and speaks about her and she really knows what she ought to be advocating for and who she ought to be standing with, but she's struggling to come to terms with that and sort of reconcile that with her traditional beliefs. And finally, LJ Parkinson, they then pronouns, who plays Charlie Parkhurst, who arrives very late in the second act, but arrives with such 
a dynamic explosion of comedy chops. LJ is also a drag king performer and Charlie Parkhurst is essentially a drag character. They are so well characterized. They are so bold and gutsy and raucous. It's one of those truly great scene-stealing supporting performances that explodes onto the stage in the middle of this bleak second act and hugely changes the mood of the room. Everything is delivered with this irrational, wide-eyed frenzy. Theirs is a character who seems to be constantly at their boiling point. It's hilarious and unnerving, but also so funny. So that's what I thought about Cowboys at the RSC. I think with new writing, it's always important that everyone goes and supports this, but in particular members of the LGBT community, trans and non-binary people, there is so much that is being spoken about in this play without being directly addressed. It's such a beautiful and smart allegory for the issues facing those communities right now, as told through the lens of this completely entertaining, hilarious, wild, scary story. Honestly, there is nobody writing queer theatre quite as exciting as Charlie Josephine. Please go and see this play. For now, thank you so much for watching this review video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming very soon about all of your favourite shows. If you have been to see Cowboys at the RSC already, or perhaps if you saw I, Joan at Shakespeare's Globe, comment down below with what you thought about it. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>